It's Nicole from Dobo Argentino USA, and today we are going to talk about dog aggression in the Dogo Argentino. I think it's really important to understand dog aggression, and we are going to discuss uh, some things that are very, very important in terms of dog aggression. So let's start out with why aggression can be a problem. Aggression can refer to behaviors that happen for a multitude of reasons in a variety of circumstances because it is genetic. And that's really important for you to understand. Aggression is a genetic characteristic. Nearly every wild animal is going to behave in an aggressive way if they need to protect their territory, their offspring, or themselves. That's just part of dog-eat-dog life in the great wild and our modern dogs do carry that genetic code inside themselves so there's a variety of things that aggression can look like and a variety of things that can trigger aggression so let's first talk about some of the things that are behavioral and they are associated with aggression in the dogo argentino the first uh, sign of intense aggression in a dogo argentino is having its ridge or its hackles raised and that can look a little different depending on the dog my youngest female has two separate areas that tend to raise up there's a puff on her butt and a puff on her shoulder as well as a seam that goes from the base of her skull to the base of her tail but she has two little puffs that that will raise when she is feeling aggressive my adult female only has a puff over her shoulder And my adult male really has a very minimal puff, and he is really more of a strong line. So what are some other signs of aggression in the Doco Argentino? Uh, If you hear an animal deep growling, if he he or she is showing her teeth, if they are snarling, which is a combination of growling while showing the teeth, if they're snapping, if they are gutturally barking in a way that sounds incredibly threatening, if they're lunging forward at the person but or the dog with no contact, um, they are doing ritualized violence behaviors in an attempt to have the other person or animal back down. Uh, aggression can continue on to be a nip that leaves no mark, a bite that does puncture the skin, a bite with enough pressure to cause a bruise, a bite that causes a puncture wound, repeated bites in rapid succession, or a bite hold and shake, which is a death sequence, um, often used on small prey. Now, dogs don't necessarily follow a particular pattern. For example, some are going to start out being very rigid and still, while others are going to lunge forward and charge. Um, If you didn't catch the beginning of the exchange, you might miss some of the things as it's moving through the different stages of aggression. So there's several different types of aggression, and we are going to talk about those. There is territorial aggression. The Dogo Argentino is a guardian breed, and they are not naturally going to be friendly to strangers or intruders for that matter. They are they actually protect their home, they protect their property, and that's one of the major reasons that people like Dogo Argentinos is because they are tremendous at protection. There is protection aggression in terms of they are either protecting themselves, protecting their pack members, meaning their fellow dogs, or protecting their human family members. There is fear aggression. And a fearful dog almost always turns aggressive if it feels cornered, if it feels trapped, if it feels like the situation to that dog, whether we know differently or not, makes the dog feel for its we- fear for its well-being. There is possessive aggression. So you may find um, lap guarding on the favorite human. You may find uh, guarding a specific toy. You may find lots of different possession aggression where it's saying this is mine and no one can have it you have 
uh, defensive aggression, which is fear that is purely defensive. The dog has decided that the best defense is a good offense and the situation is making the dog feel like it really needs to defend itself. You got your social aggression, which is a dog who is trying to either move up in pack status or considers himself at a higher pack status as another family member and they may show aggression uh, to reinforce their high pack status. You have frustration elicited aggression. That's a dog who's wanting to have something happen but can't do the thing that it wants. So if a dog was separated by a fence from a cat and its prey drive was stimulated, he may become aggressive because he can't get to the cat. He's, you know, you may come over and be like, oh, I'm going to pet Rover. And Rover's like really upset because he can't get to the cat and he might snap or growl because he's so frustrated that his prey drive can't be satisfied. Um, You have your pain elicited aggression. This can happen if you're normally calm, gentle, sweet dogo uh, is in very serious pain. Um, these are very pain tolerant dogs, but let's say it had broken a leg and you were coming towards the leg and you didn't see that it was broken and you went down to reach it. It might, you know, snap at you because it is trying to protect itself. It puts it in a life death situation for that dog. You have your redirected aggression. And this is usually when a dog is aggressive towards a specific situation, person, or animal, and someone else interferes, and that dog redirects its aggression to the person who's interfering you. Sometimes see that at dog shows or dog hunts. Um, They're super aggressive, and if you get in the way, uh, bad things can happen sometimes. Um, There is mating-related aggression. If you have a couple of intact males and you have a female in heat, uh, there's definitely going to be some sort of aggression. Uh, There there really just is. So you do have to be aware particularly of that circumstance. Um, In my own dog's case, we play at another intact male Dogo Argentino's home, and I have two intact males, and I own two intact females, and... They can't go play if it's even close to heat season because that is just a recipe for disaster. And there is predatory aggression. And that's going to be when a dog wants to catch something and kill it, like a rabbit or a squirrel or a hog. That is a predatory canine behavior that is built into them. Um... There is also, this might, you might consider this possessive aggression, but there is food aggression where if they are an animal that's grown up with food insecurity, they become extremely possessive or aggressive around food. And that can be a problem as well. So I think that there are a variety of things that can trigger aggression. Sometimes they are easy to catch if you're watching and you know what you're looking at, and sometimes they're not. So always remain vigilant. The Dogo Argentino is an incredibly powerful, muscular, strong breed. They have a bite strength of approximately 502 pounds per square inch. They're not the strongest in the dog world, but they are in the top 10. They're very, they have a very, very strong bite. They are incredibly uh, fit and muscular. They can pull hundreds of pounds. So if you've got a leash and that dog truly wants to go, it can pull you regardless of your own personal body weight. Um, These are things that are important to think about when you're getting a, a larger guardian breed that can be a rough dog, a big dog, a powerful dog. And I think that those are important factors to consider as to whether you consider this to be the right dog for you. Under the right circumstances with the right breeder, and the right owner, this can be the best dog you'll ever have. You'll never have a better dog. But in the wrong hands, this dog can be dangerous and even truthfully deadly. So I do want you to take the 
factors of dog on dog aggression or dog aggression in general seriously because they can be quite serious. So let's talk about some risk factors in terms of aggression. Uh, size is definitely a factor. If you have a teacup poodle, it can be as aggressive as you could imagine, and it is generally going to be less of a threat than a 100 pound Dogo Argentino. Obviously, a large dog can inflict significantly more damage than a small dog, which is not to say that you can't get some very significant damage from a small dog. And it is my experience that small dogs are more likely to actually bite and large dogs are more likely to threaten to bite. And if you look at dog bite statistics, the most common human dog bite comes from the Dachshund. Dachshunds, they're biters, ankle biters. Okay, so let's talk about age and why age is a factor in terms of aggression. If you have a young puppy, they are not going to have aggression at two weeks. It's just not a thing. But if you have a dog that's two years old, it's entirely possible that that dog could have an aggression problem. Uh, I do think that any dog at any age can be worked with, and there's very, 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 very few circumstances under which aggression can't be, if not managed, at least uh, set up for success. So age is a factor, you know, it's true that younger dogs are generally more malleable than older dogs, and that is important when it comes to a non-biddable breed, biddable, B-I-D-D-A-B-L-E. And what we mean by that are dogs that are stubborn. So the bull terrier is considered a non-biddable breed, and as I'm sure you know, bull terrier is genetically in the lineage of the Dogo Argentino, so they can be stubborn. Uh, a risk factor of aggression would be bite history. If you come upon a Dogo Argentino who has bit another person, who has bit another dog, uh, to a certain degree, a dog who's bit once is more likely to bite again. Um, it can be an incredible liability for your family, for other people's families, for your dog, for other people's dogs. So knowing a bite history is really, really important. Um, let's talk about the predictability of aggression. This is a really controversial ta uh, topic. Predictability is difficult under the best of circumstances. Now you can say, for example, if a dog has a bite history, there is a certain amount of, of belief that if a dog bites once, a dog will bite twice. Uh, if a dog bites with no warning, it can often bite again with no warning or n that's really unfair because I think all dogs actually do give warnings but I don't think all people are able to interpret the warning so for example if a dog is standing stiff and rigid and then it bites that gave you a warning did you interpret that as a warning you might not have but there is a certain amount of predictability to um, aggression that's important to understand uh, yeah, the dog that's that's very predictable in its behavior, the dog that does it every single time, is so much more manageable than the dog that does it occasionally or erratically. So if you know every single time somebody comes into that yard, the dog is going to behave aggressively, you can manage the yard issue by simply not letting your dog out in the yard when you're going to have the lawn cut by the gardener, right? It's predictable, you know that that's a problem. But if your dog sometimes behaves aggressively and sometimes is totally fine, uh, if you know if the dog is is has an off balance personality, it's a little nutso. It's hard to judge what it's going to do. That's a liability to me that I am not willing to really engage with. I I prefer the predictable dog because I can work with predictability. I can interpret it. I can uh, dissuade the dog from behaving in that way. Let's talk about severity. That's an issue. Uh, dogs communicate using ritualized violence. And they do that because it really preserves the pack. Actual real violence is very costly to a dog pack. If two dogs in a dog pack injure one another to the point of 
you know, seriousness, you know, a serious gash, that puts the entire pack's ability to hunt at risk. And so that's why dogs in general use ritualized violence rather than actual violence, although actual violence is, of course, employed. Dogs who, for example, are going to show their teeth, they're going to growl, but they're they're letting you know in advance, I'm uncomfortable with this situation and I'm trying to make myself look more dangerous. And that that's a huge clue that the dog is uncomfortable, you know. Now, I have dogs that play very hard. And most Dogo Argentinos that I've run into are very, very hard players. They will bruise one another. They'll scratch one another. There'll be small puncture work, puncture wounds where they bite each other on the neck and the back and the hips. And that's just part of the breed. They just play super, super hard. And I think that's a problem for people who don't know a lot about dog aggression because they can misinterpret what's essentially a good old play session with a actual incident that is aggression based and causes is is giving you cause for concern um does your dog have certain targets you know certain targets of aggression are genetic like i said if a dog that is bred to kill pumas sees a cat cats may become the target of aggression um obviously dogo argentinos were bred to hunt dangerous game like pumas so certain targets are going to be certain certain responses from that dog um you know let's let's talk about other targets this is again the management thing if you know your dog is aggressive when strangers come to the door a really easy way to manage that is to put your dog in the kennel before you answer the door period end of story hard stop there isn't a problem um, I know some people that keep cane corsos and just for everybody's safety, uh, if they're having pizza delivered, they put their dog in the kennel, get the pizza and let the dog out of the kennel because it just stops any, any potential problem. And again, I think that management is important. So it's important to understand the target of that aggression. For example, if you got a rescue Dogo Argentino and that dog was aggressive towards children and children tend to be a target that arouses that aggression in the dog, well, you can manage that. Don't expose it to children. Or work with a behaviorist who can help desensitize it. Uh, One of the things I think that's important about aggression is understanding the ease of dog motivation. Some dogs are easy to motivate. My adult male is extremely easy to motivate. He is a very soft, temperamented dog. My adult female who has police training, she is not easy to motivate. She is very submissive and she will do what I ask, but left to her own devices, she's a much more dominant dog. She's a much more uh, stubborn dog. And so, you know, it's important to understand what, what motivates the dog. If a dog is motivated by food, that's one of the easiest things you can use in your training. But if your dog is not motivated by food, and let's say it's motivated by play, um, you just need to know what motivates the dog. You know, for some it's going to be food, for some it's going to be play, for some it's going to be exercise, for some it's going to be, you know, loving and praise. You need to know what motivates the dog if you want to get a certain behavior. It's just natural. It's like an equation. You need X, it needs Y. You put that together and you get what you want. I think that if you believe that you have a serious problem with dog aggression, uh, you need to work with a professional. You need to get a behaviorist. Listening to a video is definitely not going to be it because aggression can be an incredibly dangerous and even a deadly problem. So if you think that uh, aggression is something that's coming into your household, it's complex it's tricky and it's, it's, it's definitely something that you want to get a handle on before it spins out of control. I do think that it is really important to ask a professional what their background is. You don't want to just go to the first dog trainer that pops up on Facebook. You want to see what their, their background is to make sure that they have experience in the problems that you're having. I think that you can 
manage aggression. I think you can reduce aggression, but I do not believe you can eliminate aggression because aggression is again genetic. So you need to consider the nature of the problem before you get too far gone with it, so to speak. So when we're talking about aggression, you want to remember that there are a lot of different motivations for it. You know, your dog may be afraid. He may be stressed because he feels his territory is being violated. He may feel the need to dominate. He may be protective. He may be curious. He may be overexcited. You know, one of the best things you can do is to be calm, to be decisive, and to have a plan. Uh, I always am scanning the horizon. I'm always looking for what could be a possible threat coming towards me, what could be a possible problem. Um, I think you need to be very environmentally sensitive if you are taking your dogs outdoors, uh, especially in areas where other dogs, other animals, or other people could be present. So being calm, being decisive, that's important because you're not trying to trigger an aggressive reaction, which is entirely possible. So if, if you are always fearful when you see other dogs, if you're always fearful when you go outside, dogs communicate primarily through body language and they're going to pick up on that fear energy of yours and that's likely for them to trigger on that and have it escalate. So being calm is important. Um, I like to teach my dogs to focus solely on myself. Um, If that means that I need to put them in a sit-stay when another person walks by or another dog walks by, but I work with my dogs using distraction and I tend to do it in the real world. It's fun to do obedience indoors. It's fun to do obedience at clubs and I recommend you do that for socialization purposes and experience purposes if you don't have a lot of experience in obedience. But at the end of the day, where obedience really really is important where the rubber hits the road is outdoors outdoors where you're likely to have a barking dog outdoors where you're likely to have screaming kids outdoors where you're likely to have loud cars or machinery that's when i need my dog to be reliable and that's why i am a huge advocate for outdoor obedience i think that teaching your dog that you are the most important thing in that dog's world and that you are the gateway to that dog's happiness is one of the most important things that you can do to bond with your Dogo Argentino. You have to teach the dog that all good things come from you and so that they should look to you for for cues, whether that's for food or praise. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do those things and I'll be doing some future videos on that. Um, I think it's important to manage your problem. If you have an unknown situation You can manage that using physical space. You can manage it using tools. You can manage it by having a plan. What do I mean by that? So physical space, if your dog is totally fine with another dog at 50 foot, but not fine at 20 foot, you can use space to avoid the problem. You can use a tool like a kennel. So in the case of the Cane Corso owner that kennels the dog when the pizza delivery guy shows up, he's using a tool to make sure that there isn't a problem that there will never be a problem. Um, You can definitely use other types of uh, situations to avoid confrontation. So I tend to operate when I am outdoors from the perspective that there's going to be another dog that is not controlled and is off leash by a owned by another person. Um, So I carry leashes that have extra hooks on them. They're police leashes. They're very handy in dog fights. They're easy to separate uh, two dogs and and make sure that that doesn't, you know, end up being a deadly situation. So you can use tools. You can block the other dog physically. Like I've had my dogs where I was blocking another aggressive dog with my body um, so that they didn't even see that other dog. Uh, I like to create neutral experiences when I can. So I don't want my dog to get super excited when it sees another dog. I don't want it to be lunging at the leash or straining at the leash or or barking or growling or whining or any of that kind of thing. I want it to have a neutral reaction. 
And I think that that sets your dog up for success. Um, I'm not allowing my dogs to practice aggressive behaviors. I don't want to, them to imprint that way. And the more you allow a behavior to go on without correcting it, the more likely it is to continue. So I just, I want to create neutral experiences, both with people and other dogs. And I think neutrality comes from confidence. I think it comes from repetition. I think it comes from firm alpha pack leadership. So creating neutral experiences is very important. I, uh, I'm always interested in protecting my dogs. I am never trying to get my dogs in a fight. I'm aware that it can happen. I try to seek, anytime I'm outdoors, alternative ways to get away from a problem. I want to protect my dog. I don't ever want to put my dog in the position of feeling like it needs to resort to aggression in order to solve the problem. Uh, when I do meet and greets with people, I'm always using obedience exercises. I let my dogs meet people. Um, I do sometimes let them meet dogs, not often, but occasionally I will, depending on the circumstance, but I keep it short. I, I'm, I'm not there for 30 minutes. I am keeping it short and sweet and moving it the heck on because I would rather have frequent reinforcement that's of a shorter duration. I'm aware of what triggers my dogs. I know my dogs really well. Um, it's important to understand what's going to trigger a dog so that you can manage that situation. Um, and of course, I desensitize my dogs. That's huge. Uh, I, I train my dogs outdoors. I train my dogs around other dogs. I do a lot of advanced off-leash obedience because obedience matters the most when the dog is off-leash. If your dog is not reliable off-leash, it shouldn't be off-leash, but the paradox is you can't work on off-leash reliability very well without being off-leash. I mean, it, it is a paradox of, of a certain degree. So... I want my dogs to perform their best and I do my best to desensitize them to everything. Other dogs, noises, people, um, kids. Uh, anyway, I really think that aggression is something that needs to be addressed in the Dogo Argentino. I do not believe they are a naturally overly aggressive breed. I think they have great judicious judgment. They can read a situation. They know whether aggression is called for or not. I've seen incredibly interesting situations where the dogs could have behaved aggressively but read the situation and understood that it wasn't necessary and just peeled off and, and did something different because I've worked over time over and over again to create that neutral experience to train my dogs to help them understand that I'm the alpha and I think those are, those are really important types of things. Because you want to understand that, that aggression is a serious, serious problem. Uh, fortunately, I would not say that Dogo Argentinos are inclined to be red zone dogs, meaning dogs that are uh, naturally, unpredictably aggressive. They do not have that inclination. Uh, although any rescue is more likely to have an unknown behavioral background, so do bear that in mind. I think that using positive reinforcement is very, very important. And I think that the Dogo Argentino is, is just truly a, a wonderful dog breed, but you do need to know that uh, aggression is something you're going to have to manage. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Later.